Welcome to the Lindsay Year Symposium. This is a symposium in which we're exploring the innovations and changes that were made during the years that John Lindsay was mayor of the city of New York from 1966 to 1973. And the challenges and efforts that he undertook in order to make New York a livable city in a time that was quite tumultuous in the New York and the national history. I want to welcome you to this program and to join the program that's in progress. So to my um, immediate left uh, is Joan Lyman, Jim Kagan, and Bob Newman, three individuals who were very involved with defining the city's efforts around um, providing health services. Um, so let me quickly, for those of you who don't remember, uh, today Joan is the chief of staff of the president and CEO of New York Presbyterian Hospital and Healthcare System. Prior to assuming that position in February of 2001, she served for 16 years as the Executive Deputy Vice President for Health Sciences at Columbia University. Um, during the Lindsay years, from 66 to 73, she held several posts in, in New York City government, including Assistant Budget Director and Special Assistant to the Mayor. Along with a number of colleagues, she established the Fred Hayes Prize, and there is a website um, Tony, correct me if, I'm, if I get this wrong because the card is sitting on the table there, but the, there is a website for, for not both Fred Hayes, um, so, some of the things that he accomplished called fredhayes.info. In, info, info. And I suggest you go up on the website. There's a lot of wonderful information and stories about Fred, but there's also information about the Fred Hayes Prize. Obviously, Joan has had a long history both in the Lindsay administration and in healthcare. And to her um, left, as I said, is Jim Kagan, who's currently a consulting director of the Chartist Group. He has over 50, 30 years' experience assisting healthcare providers in developing and achieving their strategic and financial goals. Prior to joining the Chartist Group, Jim was co-founder of APM Management Consultants and vice president of Computer Sciences Corporation Global Health Solutions Group. Before getting involved in consulting, he was Deputy Commissioner of Health for New York City during the Lindsay years and the Director of the New Jersey Division of Youth and Family Services, which is the New Jersey version of our social service and child welfare agencies. And finally, um, Bob Newman, who currently is the President Emeritus of Continuing Health Partners, and many of you will remember Bob when he was the President of Beth Israel. Um, Bob served, as I said, as the president and chief executive officer of Continuum when it was founded in 97 until 2000, and he was the president and chief operating executive officer of Beth Israel Hospital. He is a professor of epidemiology and population health and a professor of psychiatry at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine of Yeshiva University. Um, are you still doing that, Bob? Are you still an active yes. academic? Yes. Well, yes. Yes. I'm an academic and I'm active. They <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we've got three individuals who both have a l strong history with the healthcare industry and with the Lindsay years, and so I want to start by turning this over to Joan, who's going to set, set the stage. The topic is, the, is health uh, policy and management in the Lindsay years. And Stan just said something about getting away from the budget. But there really is no getting away from the budget if you're talking about uh, health in the Lindsay years, because it was uh, an enormous, major part then of the, uh, of the city tax levy. Uh, budget and when uh, Lindsay assumed office, the the not only was the total high, but there was a very high per capita tax levy expenditure for um, for health services that was part of the city's portfolio, and this was due largely to the fact that there was a large and probably overly large uh, municipal hospital system, and the politics around that municipal hospital system were enormously contentious. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid had just been passed by the Congress, really just, as Lindsay uh, took office. And no one uh, in the city truly knew what the consequences of those, um, of those two uh, very seminal laws in our history uh, had to do with the city, what, what it would mean for the city. And, and the Lindsay administration had to cope with that. And indeed, it meant a great deal for the city. 
there was a, the Department of Health had uh, once been a very great Department of Health under Dr. Leona Baumgartner. Her name was legendary at the time. It's probably faded now, but it was legendary at the time, but it had gone into decline, and a, a, a real decline. It was, um, it was nowhere near uh, performing at the level that was required at the same time you remember we had a burgeoning welfare population and a large proportion of poor in the city and the public health department was just uh, barely coping if that with with uh, its traditional responsibilities let alone the um, the new ones that it was rapidly acquiring technology in the city was absolutely antique I recall when I came into the city they weren't quite on Centrix, not yet. And when I needed to call Washington, remember I had come from Washington with Fred Hayes and the, and the um, and OEO, and when we tried to call Washington, you had to go through the city operator who called the national operator, who called the Washington operator, who called the agency operator, who got you your party. It was a long, extended, difficult uh, process. We were still using mimeograph machines, and I'll never forget when I walked into Henry Rosner's office, many of you remember Henry was second only only to Jim Cavanaugh in terms of his legendary uh, work with numbers. He was the financial officer for what became HRA, and he ran the, all the payment systems and all the rest of it for the welfare system and the Medicaid system. And he showed me into a huge cavernous room, huge cavernous room with rows and rows and rows of desks and at the tables, I'm sorry, tables, and at those tables sat men with eye shades and huge ledgers and they were writing Medicaid numbers. That's how the city was recording and paying for Medicaid and, and its predecessor, the, the uh, charitable institution's budget. Now that, that was just extraordinary if you think about it. And then the final uh, stage setting uh, point I want to make was the burgeoning uh, heroin epidemic, which was, as those of us who were there recall, really uh, Frightening, frightening on the streets. Crime was up, muggings and so forth for money, and and that was a major, major issue that the administration had to face. So the challenges were really quite extraordinary, and as extraordinary as the challenges were, so were the successes. Not everything was successful, but there was a great deal that was. And and what we're going to um, what we're going to sort of illustrate, uh, my two colleagues and I, as we talk about three major areas in the health. Uh, uh, in the in health policy and management for Lindsay were uh, were the the innovations that were made in management the the uh, beginning to bring accountability for results and efficiency into the uh, health arena as well as other arenas of the city now that's a lot of conventional wisdom now we all know that but it wasn't such conventional wisdom then it was it was something quite new innovation as I mentioned the the willingness to try new approaches to seemingly intractable intractable problems which was a key to the successes that the administration had. And finally, uh, we're all going to stress political courage because it took political courage to do a number of the initiatives that, uh, uh, that the mayor and his uh, chief lieutenants uh, put into place in the health area in that period. So uh, with that brief introduction, I'll turn to my colleague, Jim Kagan. As you know, the mayor created super agencies and did the same thing in uh, health services by putting together the Department of Health, the Department of Mental Health, the uh, Public Health Laboratories, and the Office of the Medical Examiner, where death delights to serve the living. If you uh, ever go by First Avenue and see, the, see that inscription. Um, the health department, as Joan said, was in real disarray um, and accused of primarily of management uh, inefficiencies and problems executing and delivering the kinds of programs that were needed uh, at that time by the city's population. Uh, and the mayor concluded, as, as pretty much everyone had, that this was a, a real management problem. And uh, there was a physician who was in charge of HSA at that time, but the mayor asked that uh, gentleman to leave the post and with great courage uh, uh, wanted, uh, wanted and did appoint uh, Gordon Chase, a 37-year-old management whiz who I guess could spell health but knew absolutely nothing 
about health care. Had no background in it. Uh, certainly uh, had been to the doctor, but aside from that, uh, was was absolutely without any background in health care. And the mayor uh, took enormous fire from the entire establishment. I, I, there was one physician who ran NYU who, who, who uh, thought it was a good idea. But although even the critics uh, acknowledged Chase's management capabilities, uh, that's how well thought of he was in that area, uh, everybody thought this was a bad idea, but the mayor, the mayor took that risk. Um, so, uh, Gordon and, and the mayor thought uh, in order to get things going, they would do a couple of, they would follow a couple of management principles, which I think were pretty neat. In terms of innovation, they were going to uh, take new approaches to solving public health problems. And there were a lot of new ones that had come along with this uh, influx of, of poor folks. Uh, coming to the city. And they would do that without the support of most of the professionals in the department and around the city in public health. That doesn't mean uh, everyone was against them, but there was this, this cry against uh, Chase and the mayor for not being public health professionals continued into, uh, into uh, the, the development of new programming and the expansion of old programming. And they would reach beyond the structure, the infrastructure of the department to accomplish this, uh, innovative. Then, how would they do that? They would pick services that were, had a scope where they could be fixed. Gordon and I think the mayor knew that they didn't have endless numbers of years to do this. So they didn't take on some of the huge structural problems like the Health and Hospitals Corporation that to this day is still trying to define itself and fund itself. They took on programs that had a scope that could be improved. They focused attention and resources on them. They scaled the programs to the need, and they got results rapidly. In terms of focusing attention, uh, Nat Leventhal used to call Gordon and say, you're not mentioning the mayor enough in your press releases. I was talking to Goldmark about this. And uh, uh, Gordon was in Europe. Uh, traveling and he sent Nat a, a postcard and said, we're mentioning the mayor's name all over. So uh, he was good at, at, uh, at getting attention. And then as a manager, as Joan said, uh, getting quantitative results was not the way government worked at that time. But both the mayor and, uh, and Chase were very good at that and believed that's what had to be done. So let me take you quickly through a couple of examples Lead poisoning screening, I, I worked on this program, I don't know if you remember, uh, there were 250,000 kids under six. A lot of them ate lead paint, wasn't supposed to be in their apartments, but it was, and uh, heavy metal poisoning is, is death, or retardation, all sorts of horrible things. And we were testing 8,000 kids a year. Well, you're not gonna get through uh, 250,000 kids at that rate. Uh, we talked about expanding the program. The professionals said, this is going to be a disaster. You can't take blood from a, a kid under six from the arm or the wrist. You're going to be and it's going to be on the front page. It could be not, not true. Um, so we decided on a goal of 3,000 tests a week which would get 150,000 kids tested in a year, and we'd be able to keep up with the 25 or 30,000 new kids coming into that population every year. And we had 26 district health centers, and if we could get 24, uh, 25 more sites, if everybody did 50, 60 tests a week, that's 3,000. So we went to private hospitals, to HHC hospitals, to some of the neighborhood health centers, it's not a big deal. It sounded huge, but if you break it down, it's not a big deal. And uh, then the mayor convened uh, Gordon with the Department of Housing and said, we've got to go test these walls. And uh, by putting together these various pieces with not a lot of money, 
the problem uh, was not solved, but it, it moved much closer to solution. A second illustration of these principles is uh, the prison health and mental health program. Um, there were a number of widely publicized suicides in the prison, which got everybody's attention. And looking into it, it was quite clear, and I remember Gordon and the mayor were horrified to learn that the health care and the mental health care in our prisons was provided by um, marginally qualified older physicians who were being paid, I think it was $16 an hour, which even in those times wasn't a lot of money. And they were completely unsupervised. I mean, these guys would just come in and do whatever they could do and leave. Uh, and that was unacceptable to the mayor. So it took uh, Alan Gibbs, who's no longer with us, and, and, uh, and Gordon two years to convince uh, Martin Cherkasky at Montefiore to take over health care and subsequently mental health care in the city's prison system. And as you may know, this became a standard around the country for providing care. Uh, in prison systems, and it was a tremendous success for a long time. Uh, other major contributions I'm just going to run through quickly. Uh, what's extraordinary to me is this buffoon who knew nothing about public health created uh, programs like those two and many others I'm going to run through quickly, which were adopted all over this country. Uh, and around the world in some cases uh, uh, that never would have been conceived of or, or done, or few would have been conceived of or done. First, this whole notion of accountable management and reporting not just epidemiology and clinical information, but actually reporting on numbers of people and results. Um, you couldn't get a birth certificate in this city for nine or 12 months uh, until we tackled that problem. Uh, publicizing results of uh, restaurant and food processing inspections, opposed, bad idea, can't do it. Uh, citywide screening program for hypertension in non-clinical venues, can't do it. One, people would be too excited, it, it doesn't work well, but you make people aware of the issue. Uh, and then they go get tested again and get treated. Uh, pro uh, progress and standards for mental health activity are spending $200 million a year on mental health contracts. Nobody knows what the, the, the patient's getting better, are they getting worse, what, you know, is this a good program? And it, nobody knew. Uh, as with drug addiction, people were becoming to, uh, coming to understand that drug addiction and alcoholism were also health problems. They weren't just, uh, you know, lapses of uh, will. And so we had among the first uh, comprehensive treatment programs, abortion surveillance, if you remember, July 1, 1970, uh, New York law permitted abortions. And what was critical, uh, it was having objective data on what was the result of all these hundred and some odd thousand abortions that were done from that year forward. Uh, New York did a terrific job because it prepared, the health department prepared for this. Uh, I know that my brother-in-law was head of abortion surveillance at CDC. It's critical to defending uh, that program. Rat control, uh, our current health commissioner is running around the Bronx trying to do something about this. And uh, finally, to introduce Bob Newman, the largest and best methadone maintenance and ambulatory detox programs. Uh, ever. And as you see, I've, I've written a pose next to almost every one of these things, and yet uh, this is the state of public health brought to you by these dopes who knew nothing about <laughs> health care. Uh, for somebody who for the better part of 35 years has been going around the world advocating for uh, basically addiction treatment on demand for everybody who wants it and needs it, and specifically method on maintenance. It was uh, very reassuring and gratifying to, in preparation for this uh, presentation, to go over the experience in uh, New York City in the early 70s, because sometimes, uh, you know, uh, continuing to come uh, against this enormous opposition 
uh, I truly do ask myself, Jesus, did we really accomplish that? Was it really possible? And it's gratifying to know, yes, we uh, indeed really did. Um, as somebody who uh, was uh, with uh, HSA from uh, early uh, 1970 until the end of 74, beginning of 75, uh, uh, I would characterize the uh, Chase uh, uh, approach and the secret to his success as uh, open-mindedness, completely open-minded, and also uh, just applying common sense to assessing the problem and considering uh, possible uh, solutions. Uh, basically, it meant uh, challenging assumptions, and I'm sure that uh, Gordon Chase uh, consulted a lot of experts, but he really refused to accept, you know, glib, off the top of the head uh, responses like, and Jim referred to this in the case of uh, lead testing of children, uh, people saying, you know, you just can't do it. Uh, it. It hasn't been done, it can't be done, it'd be a disaster if you tried to do it. And he would continually say, why? And he was driven, he was driven by the fact that you have to identify the goal, and that goal has to determine what the strategy is going to be. Years later, in the hospital administration world, I went to some administrative uh, um, uh, I don't know, training program, and somebody came up with the saying, uh, you can't get there from here, but you can get here from there. And for years, I had no clue what the hell that's supposed to mean. I sort of quoted it every once in a while to make myself feel important, but I had no idea. And then it occurred to me that, in fact, what that apparently represented was the fact that you have to set the goal and then figure out how to get there. And that simply, in the case certainly of addiction, had never been done, and with very few exceptions, uh, has not been done since. Chase started off with the assumption Nothing justifies abandoning people who want and need and who might die without a treatment. And with that basic assumption, he said, okay, you figure out what resources you have and how you're going to apply those resources, but that's the goal, and we're not going to settle for any goal that's less, and it was really uh, quite extraordinary. Uh, the New York City Methadone Maintenance Program. Um, as you can see, the, the growth was just uh, phenomenal. We admitted the first patient November, December 1970. Within two years, we had somewhere in the neighborhood of 11,000 people actively in treatment. This is just the New York City HSA methadone program. There were other methadone providers, but this program went from zero to some 11,000 uh, patients in the course of a couple of years. Um, by the end of 1974, there had been over 20,000 individuals admitted a total of some 22,000 times. I want to stress, and again, this was uh, clear from what Joan has said and what Jim has said, uh, in the case of methadone maintenance, there were some very strong, fervent advocates. I cannot recall, and Jim and I have discussed this, and Joan, uh, I cannot recall a single advocate of methadone maintenance who was supportive of the goal that Chase had set for himself and for the city and for the department, and that is to make treatment on uh, demand a reality in the course of uh, a few years. The, mo the more fervent the supporters of methadone, the more concerned and adamantly opposed they were to the notion of this massive expansion that had never been done before, predicting the, the end of the world certainly for methadone maintenance, that I would set back addiction treatment by decades. So I have to stress that even the best friends, and I include Dr. Dole and Dr. Neiswander, who developed methadone maintenance treatment and who were very, very close personal friends as well as colleagues, even they, maybe especially they, were not supportive of what we were setting out to do in the city health department. And you can see it was very, very large, very effective, and the success in terms of treatment outcomes was every bit as good as any other program that had been done on a small scale uh, since. Uh, that approach has uh, been uh, uh, adopted by a few places, not too many. Hong Kong was one. Hong Kong, uh, late 1974, sent a group of uh, uh, their leading uh, health people to go around the world to see what could Hong Kong do to make treatment available to every single heroin addict promptly who wanted it. Uh, the only place they saw that offered any hope of that was uh, the New York City HSA program, and they emulated the program, and as you can see, in the course of just about a year, they had some 10,000 people in treatment, and within a matter of months thereafter, they were able to publicize public service announcements on buses and uh, wherever. Uh, if you or a friend have a problem with heroin addiction, we have help available for you today. 
That was uh, possible briefly uh, in New York City in 1974. It's been possible in a few other places since, but basically it reflects um, doc, um, Gordon Chase's view, this is the only acceptable goal, and there has to be a commitment to achieve that goal. And I think what's been shown in Hong Kong with no resources, in New York City with very few resources, that if the commitment is there, it can be uh, achieved. Another example, another part of the world, uh, France in uh, 1995 had 52 methadone patients. Why 52 and not 50 or 59 or whatever? I don't know, but that's the number that's always been used. 52 methadone patients in the entire country. And they said there's a ridiculous uh, era of AIDS. They made a resolution. They had to have some kind of uh, substitution treatment for everybody who wanted it. They went primarily with buprenorphine, but the bottom line is, in the matter of a few years, they had tens of thousands of people receiving treatment. Again, I think it's a reflection of what was possible if you followed uh, Chase's uh, orientation. Th there's another program that, uh, to my shame, uh, I uh, spent very little time talking about in the last 35 years, which was at least as, uh, uh, as impressive as a methadone maintenance program, and that was an ambulatory detox program. In the case of methadone, there were a lot of people who hated it. There were some people who loved it and were very afraid of going too fast. In the case of ambulatory detox, I can't recall a single person who thought that this was a good idea. Not a single, but nobody thought that ambulatory detox was a good idea. It was time limited, very short intervention. The assumption was that virtually everybody would go back to using again. Chase decided that even with the best success in developing long-term treatment programs, there would still be a lot of people who could not be accommodated, who would not want or consider long-term treatment. And he said, what are you going to do about these people? And he wanted to offer at least one day at a time, which is a catchy slogan, uh, an alternative to the next fix uh, with heroin. As you can see, um, within uh, about three and a half years, there were six clinics in the, uh, in the ambulatory detox program, also run uh, by HSA, there had been almost 64,000 admissions. So clearly, if everybody else thought it was a lousy idea and totally useless, the addicts on the street did not feel that way. Uh, and the cost of this massive program was $1.3 million uh, a year. I said nobody was for it. There are a lot of people who are against it to the extent that anybody even took ambulatory detox seriously enough to, uh, to, <laughs> to, to comment on it. 1949, a couple of leaders in the field of addiction said withdrawal is only the first and least important step in the treatment of narcotic addiction. 1971, other uh, leaders in the field, short-term medical detox must serve only as a basis for continuing intermediate and long-term psychosocial rehab and not as an end in itself. New York City HSA, ambulatory detox, it was an end in, end in itself, and clearly the target population found it a very worthwhile end to uh, pursue. Uh, again, this is just the rationale for it, that uh, no matter how much we expanded it, um, uh, long-term treatment, we expanded it massively within HSA and the city as a whole. There'd still be a lot of people in the admissions to ambulatory detox uh, substantiate this who simply wouldn't go into long-term treatment, couldn't go, and again, abandonment was not uh, considered an option. This is just showing, you know, this massive growth, steady growth. Uh, by the uh, end of 19, in 1974, for the first time, for a relatively brief period of time, it was possible in New York City to get admitted to methadone maintenance or to ambulatory detox with essentially no weight. And even then, the steady increase in demand for ambulatory detox uh, persisted. Um, the idea, in part, was to reach people who had not been reached by long-term treatment. Again, phenomenally, and this is based on Gordon Chase's just instinct, Phenomenally, 72% of all the people admitted to the ambulatory detox program had never previously been in any kind of long-term treatment. And even those who had a history of heroin addiction dating back 20 years or more, as you can see, some 60% had never been in long-term treatment, but they came to ambulatory detox. Surprisingly, uh, um, at least to me, uh, and this was not a primary goal, this was sort of serendipitous as an added benefit, some 15% of all the people admitted for ambulatory detox, most of whom had never been in long-term treatment, 
accepted referral after an average stay of about seven days in ambulatory detox, accepted referral to a long-term program, and entered, confirmed to have been entered into long-term uh, treatment. And yet today, ambulatory detox, to the extent anybody talks about it, is just it's just dismissed as a total irrelevancy. There's an American Society of Addiction Medicine. Opiate detoxification alone is not a treatment. The society does not support opioid detoxification unless it is part of an integrated continuum of services. And Gordon's response would be, so, so what are you going to do for the people who are not in treatment? Reference has been made to this extraordinary appointment, um, the confidence of Lindsay, the courage to appoint Gordon Chase is just, to me, just, even now, I, I just can't comprehend it. Um, 37 years old, his education was limited to a bachelor's degree with a political science major. He'd had some administrative posts in the State Department, his special area of expertise, this man was coming on to take control over all health and hospitals uh, run by the city of New York. Area of special expertise was Cuban and Latin American affairs, his background in health, as Jim indicated, was absolutely nothing except perhaps his visit to his own physician, which might have taught him something. Um, Jim made reference to the opposition, just two examples, New York Academy of Medicine. The Academy considers Mr. Chase professionally unqualified to exercise the enormous responsibility of safeguarding the health of, this, of the vast community. The, on a national level, the editorial board of the American Journal of Public Health, we failed to see how Chase, without knowledge or experience in public health or medical care, can provide the required leadership of planning and developing innovative health services. And again, I suggest to you that it was Lindsay's brilliance in recognizing that what it takes is a commitment, administrative skills, and not the traditional experience, which was critical to the success of Chase. As amazing as the uh, confidence and the uh, courage of Lindsay in appointing Chase, I have to tell you, um, Lindsay's uh, Chase's appointment of me to, to run this, you know, this unprecedented, uh, universally vilified approach uh, is to me even more amazing, because at least Chase had a record of brilliant administrative leadership. I had literally, and this is not mock humility, I had nothing. I was 32 years old. I was still a resident in preventive medicine with the city of New York. My uh, experience educationally, MD, MPH, which I had never used, and two years of surgical residency. You can imagine how valuable that was to me in running these addiction programs. Uh, I had spent nine months of administrative work running a national nutrition survey uh, in New York City, the purpose of which was to basically convince the public that the reason people are malnourished is, in the words of uh, Congressman Whitten from Mississippi at the time, poor people do not put the same emphasis on good nutrition as the rest of us folks. Uh, okay, and my job was to run this uh, sham uh, survey here in New York City. Uh, special expertise, I, had absolute, I didn't even know anything about Cuban or Latin American affairs. And background in addiction, nothing. And I kid you not, nothing. Um, and yet it worked out pretty well, obviously. Uh, again, I would just summarize by saying that the hallmarks of the Lindsay administration, and specifically HSA, was to apply common sense and to apply an awful lot of courage in determining policy and to not accept as a given the views of experts if there was no substantive rationalization for, rationale for it, maybe rationalization, um, an absolute refusal to abandon those in need. And I think that came out in the documentary film that many of us saw of the Lindsay administration a couple of months ago. And again, my admiration and, and amazement over what Chase accomplished is obviously a tribute to Mayor Lindsay, who had the wisdom and the courage, in spite of a lot of opposition, to appoint him. So it was a great experience. Thanks. What you have heard from my colleagues are a series of very, very remarkable achievements in, uh, in public health and addiction services. But in fact, uh, while they weren't small, they were not the major preoccupation in terms of health in the Lindsay years. Uh, the major financial and political challenges in the health area revolved around the issues in the municipal hospital system and the advent of, uh, of Medicare and Medicaid. And that was the major storyline at the time. And many of the issues that we grappled with at that point are still with us 
today as we grapple with another generation of, of health care reform. Uh, as I pointed out earlier, the, the city was, I didn't give the number, the city was spending roughly $100 per person of precious city tax levy for every city resident, whether or not they use city health services. And in 1966, that would have covered five doctor visits for each of us every year. Uh, of course, it wasn't buying five doctor visits for every year. What it was buying it was mainly supporting the large and very unwieldy municipal hospital system, which had grown by a series of acquisitions. Uh, as hospitals, small, not-for-profit hospitals, some of them under uh, religious auspices, some of them under other charitable auspices, would run into problems and, and, and see bankruptcy looming, they would put pressure on their local councilman, on the board of estimate, on the mayor of the city to acquire the municipal, acquire it as a municipal hospital. And that had been the policy and the practice until Lindsay um, uh, made a, a very courageous decision, which was not, I think, wildly heralded at the time. Very early in his administration, he refused to acquire a small Catholic hospital in the Bronx, St. Francis Hospital. Uh, and that was a seminal uh, decision, uh, and it put a stop, finally, after a great deal of political pressure, to this question of constantly adding to the city's responsibilities by picking up every hospital that ran into trouble. The hospital system was underfinanced, there's no question. It was undermanaged. Uh, it's we administrators were earning, it's, uh, the hospital directors were earning something like 15, 18,000 a year, something like that, which was very low, not even competitive in that time when you think of what hospital administration deals with. Um, and it, was, it became a very contentious issue. You had Senator Seymour Thaler, State Senator Seymour Thaler, <coughs> made it his career to go around to the hospitals at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon with the radio or the television cameras and discover the cockroaches in the, in the basement of Bellevue or wherever he was, and this was a big news event. And the pressure um, uh, was, really, um, was really severe. Uh, one of the most forward-looking uh, uh, health uh, decisions, I think, in the Lindsay or any administration, was again early in the administration, the decision to put into the capital budget a number of primary care centers. We called them, I think, neighborhood family care centers. It was a recognition that the, 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 the way to stem the growth, one way to stem the growth of the municipal hospital system, if you didn't just want to chop beds out of the system, which was at that point politically um, uh, unbelievable, uh, was to put set up primary care practices in low-income neighborhoods so people could go to the practices and receive their health care without, um, without having to go to the hospital. Now, it took numbers of years for those to come out of the capital budget and onto the streets, but they in fact did. And uh, uh, by that time, they were not enough to stem the problem, as you can see, because nowadays, as we are facing health care reform in this city and across the country, there are simply not enough primary care doctors or primary care um, uh, community health centers to uh, uh, to to deal with the uh, demand that we're we're expecting as newly as as now uninsured uh, individuals become insured. Um, all, while all this was happening, Medicare and Medicaid had been passed, and no one was quite sure what it what it really meant. Rockefeller. Uh, uh, the Rockefeller, when he enacted the state Medicaid program, was exceedingly generous, and he had an eligibility level or for Medicaid, which was into the middle class, middle class incomes. I remember my father, who was a physician, saying to me at the time, "This is lunacy. He's going to bankrupt the state. This is absolute lunacy to put all these people on a publicly subsidized program." And my father wasn't a particularly political conservative, but he was a physician who knew what would happen uh, in terms of demand uh, and expenditure when uh, when this happened. Uh, there was enormous pressure from the unions, from Victor Gottbaum uh, and, and the union leaders and from the politicians. Here you have Medicare and Medicaid. It's going to pay now for people over 65 and poor people who are using the municipal hospitals. You've got to put more money into the municipal hospitals. You've got to put more money in. And in fact, 
the uh, city did put more money in uh, as a result of Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, it, I don't remember which budget it was, but it was shortly after Medicaid. It was Fred Hayes was there already, so it was either the second or the third year. Put a, a substantial sum of money into the municipal hospitals. Well, of course, it didn't turn out that way. Uh, what Medicare and Medicaid did was the money followed the patient. It didn't come to the city. It didn't come to the hospital. If you were over 65 and you had hospital care, the money went to the hospital that gave you your care. And the same was true of Medicaid. And lo and behold, very quickly, within almost a six-month period, people voted with their feet. And Medicare-eligible patients went into the voluntary system, and many Medicaid patients who could or who had a voluntary system in their neighborhood, they went into the voluntary system, and the city began to bleed tax levy into the, <clears throat> into the private system. <clears throat> Excuse me. And to add insult to injury, when the state enacted Medicaid, it said that the city, on average, had to spend 30 cents for e of every Medicaid dollar. 25 cents if it was a federally eligible Medicaid recipient, 30 cents if it was a state eligible Medicaid recipient. And so not only was, was money that had formerly been coming to the city leaving the city for the voluntary house, but the city was now paying on average 30 cents on every dollar of everyone who had care outside the system. Well, it was, uh, it was a disaster. It was a disaster. And uh, Rockefeller quickly realized it was a disaster, and he cut the Medicaid eligibility levels in 1969. It was the first time that the state had ever pulled back on an entitlement, and it put an enormous hole in the city budget. And so uh, the mayor and the Budget Bureau had no choice but to find the most painless way to take that money back. And what they did was they took that, the money back that they had given to the municipal hospitals earlier in that budget year. Now you're wondering, how can they do that eight, nine months into the budget year? How could they take that money back? And how they could is important to one of the next points I'm going to make, which is that the, the municipal hospital hadn't spent it. And why hadn't the municipal hospital spent it? Well, there was a great deal of inefficiency in the system and all the rest of it. But the truth of the matter was that to hire a nurse, you had to go through the Department of Hospitals, the Department of Personnel, and the Bureau of the Budget until you could get a certificate that you could hire that nurse. Well, that process took about a half a year. So if you, uh, if you authorize positions in the budget, it took, the, it took the hospital, the Department of Hospitals at that point, and the individual hospitals, roughly a half a year to get the actual authorization to hire that, that position that had been funded. Well, you can imagine the advocates, was, there was a storm. I mean, I'm sure you've been talking during this whole period about the, the political uh, situation there, the strength of the community advocates, the strength of the, of the municipal unions, the fact that no one was interested at that point in, in particularly in fiscal responsibility. They were interested in, in services. And it was, uh, it was um, Lindsay had to do something in response to this storm. And so he created a blue ribbon commission under Gerald Peel, who was the uh, editor of Scientific American at that point and a highly respected figure. And he said, tell me what to do about the municipal hospitals. Well, <coughs> what they told him to do was to take the hospitals and put them in a not-for-profit corporation. They said the city can't both regulate the hospitals and run the hospitals. It's a conflict of interest. Uh, you really have to take those hospitals and let them run themselves. Non-starter, politically. Totally non-starter. So the Peel Commission was put on the shelf, and the issue was how do we respond to the continuing uh, furor about the, the hospitals. And the solution, which many have condemned, but which I, I, I confess to some bias, I was part of the, uh, of the group, uh, the small group that came up with this, the solution was to put the hospitals in a public benefit corporation. And the reasoning behind that was precisely, at least in my mind, was exactly the experience of taking six to seven months to be able to hire something, someone. H hospitals could not operate in local communities under the crushing weight of the city overhead agencies at that point, which were crushing 
in their procedures and their red tape. I think uh, 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 Bob Newman and, and Jim Kagan have pointed that out in terms of some of the other uh, uh, programs that went on. Uh, and so when the Field Commission failed to produce a politically feasible solution, uh, we, uh, the decision was made to put them in a public benefit corporation, which not was somewhat surprisingly went through the legislature fairly easily. And um, uh, we, we said we wouldn't say any more about Jim Cavanaugh, but Jim was instrumental in, uh, in, uh, in getting that uh, through. Now, that initiative, uh, which is one of the major initiatives, like, or, like it or not, that came out of the Lindsay administration, certainly didn't solve the problems of sizing the system or indeed whether there should be a public system at all. Uh, but it did over time do a, a number of things. It did contain the city's financial support for the system. The city's ta I, I don't even know if the city's giving any tax levy to the, uh, to the corporation now. There was a maintenance of effort clause in the, um, in the, uh, in the l authorizing legislation. Um, it was contested, it was tried, they tried to overturn it in the, um, in the courts. I, I'm not quite sure what happened, but I do know that the city is certainly not subsidizing a municipal hospital system today to the extent that it would have had to if it were still directly running the system. And it, it insulated further mayors from direct responsibility from day-to-day -day operations of the hospital, which is which hospitals which mayors should not be doing. They should not be the ones who are called to task for the cockroaches in the basement of Bellevue or or whatever uh, uh, might go on. Now it doesn't in, it, it does not institute them from policy or from the provision of capital. And uh, Mayor Koch has often said publicly that the most disastrous political decision of his administration was the closing of Sydenham Hospital, which cost him a great deal of grief and does illustrate, I think, the, the difficulty this issue posed for, for mayors. I think over time, and it's arguably it also enabled the hospitals to hire better leadership and improve the quality and the management of the services they provide. It's a far different system today uh, than it was uh, many years ago. So that's, um, that's sort of a counterpoint to the, um, the kind of clear-cut achievements that, uh, uh, that my, um, my colleagues were talking about. But I think nonetheless, it, 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 it represented an important response to a, a very serious and very contentious and almost all-consuming problem. So I'm going to switch now into um, just briefly summarizing what those of us up here think are the lessons that are learned from the experience of the Lindsay administration in, uh, in health care. Uh, and they're clearly, there's just, I'm going to go briefly because it's, some, it's really a repetition of the themes you've heard earlier. Uh, management, accountability for measured efficiency and results, an obvious uh, lesson and a serious one. The importance of innovation, of thinking outside the envelope, and of challenging the conventional wisdom. Enough has been said about that. That was a hallmark of, of the Lindsay years. Uh, I think I want to say, uh, though it's also content, uh, arguable, that uh, reorganization can be an effective strategy. It's not in itself an answer to any uh, any problem, but it can be a catalyst to affect change. It can open opportunities that otherwise would be difficult to do through uh, established channels. And uh, HSA is HSA did that. And although Beam dismantled HSA along with the super agencies, I think it's it's useful to note that Giuliani brought it back to the extent that he combined health and mental health in one agency, and that's what we have today, with, of course, the municipal hospitals now sitting in the, uh, in the Health and Hospital Corporation. Another lesson is the importance of political and administrative courage, of being willing to take risks and be flexible enough to alter course. Uh, Bob didn't mention that Lindsay started out his addiction uh, policy with a, an agency called the Addiction Services Agency, which emphasized non- uh, non-drug treatment that did not work, it could not be scalable, and so in midstream he was flexible. He changed course and began to back the uh, 
uh, uh, the uh, methadone maintenance and ambulatory detox. Uh, but almost, it's almost paradoxical, toxical, but a lesson from the Lindsay years is there's also value in political modesty, particularly if you're faced with the need to change or repair large systems, as was the case with the municipal hospital systems. Uh, focus targets results can be more successful than trying major o overhauls, even though the latter may be necessary. And I sort of say to myself, what's the lesson for today in that when we're thinking about uh, major, uh, major overhauls of our healthcare system? And finally, the importance of collect correctly assessing the degrees of freedom which New York City as a local jurisdiction has when it has to deal with issues like health that are uh, clearly state and national issues as well as uh, uh, local issues. And to be wary that health reform, while the city is no longer directly in the business of providing um, hospital care, um, the, the new um, uh, health reform bill could hold some unforeseen challenges uh, for the city as it unfolds over the next, uh, the next several years. So Jim and Bob, would you want to add to some of those? Because those are collective uh, lessons learned that we all worked out together. I, I think the individual uh, programs, some of which have been uh, spoken about, really illustrate those uh, collective uh, lessons. Questions for any of us? Sure. Roger Hers, uh, if tomorrow morning you were uh, CEO of HHC or Commissioner of Health, what would you do? My answer is that I would do, I think, pretty much what, uh, what's being done now. I think our Commissioner of Health in New York, uh, the last one, Tom Frieden, and now uh, the other Tom, whose name just escapes me right Martin this month. Right. Uh, have done a great deal in terms of... Uh, facing the challenges not only in public health, but they have faced the question of primary care, uh, of preventive care, um, smoking, the, 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 the uh, anti-smoking initiative. I mean, you can go down the list. I think they have done a, 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 a terrific job. Uh, as far as the Health and Hospital Corporation is concerned, I think its problems have less to do with the city right now. Uh, Alan Avilas has to deal with the state and the federal government. Uh, uh, I don't think I, that this is, this is a sea change since the Lindsay years. He can't turn to Bloomberg and say, I need money. Want to mention one or two of the external obstacles? Pardon me? Want to mention one or two of the external obstacles? Oh, there are a lot of them. <laughs> you mean in terms of health care reform? No. Oh, there's, there's all the changes in reimbursement that are coming down. Um, uh, there's the, the quality initiative. I mean, there's a whole, uh, a whole set of challenges to hospitals uh, in which the municipal hospitals are not at all exempt. And they have the added problem, which is that the, um, uh, the uh, new entitlements under the health reform bill will not include undocumented uh, aliens, undocumented immigrants. And the municipal hospital system, I believe, probably has the largest share of undocumented immigrants. So they're facing enormous budget uh, challenges uh, in, in the next coming. I, I, that's a short answer, but it's a very complex problem. C could I just address the uh, Department of Health? Uh, uh, I would ask what can be done, what must be done in terms of addiction in New York City today. Joan mentioned the phenomenally uh, admirable, wonderful, and apparently effective anti-smoking uh, efforts of the city where hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, nicotine gum and patches have been made available free of charge by the department. In terms of narcotic addiction and the estimated number of narcotic addiction of narcotic addicts in New York City today is essentially the same as it was back in 1970, you ha hear nothing whatsoever by way of encouraging people to come and seek treatment for addiction. Absolutely nothing. And I gotta tell you, the treatment of addiction, we know, is at least as efficacious as the treatment of smoking with uh, nicotine replacement, which I think is terrific, but there's been zero, and that's not an external barrier, it's just a lack of willingness on the part of uh, the last two administrations, and I have great respect for what they did in health, but they just have had zero interest in, uh, in addressing it. Much of the hallmark of the Lindsay administration's management reforms are focused on the way in which uh, things became data-driven and consumers were empowered to do uh, 
uh, things and have some kinds of choice. Whereas in healthcare, there wasn't anything uh, in the way of increasing consumer choice and availability of the different kinds of alternative medical treatments that are available. It, um, as uh, um, Senator Tom Harkin said before the approval of the uh, uh, health reform bill, uh, the uh, chairman of the health committee said that if we keep on practicing medicine the way we are, health reform is not going to work. Uh, there has to be some kind of a change in the emphasis in getting to people before they get sick. Well, I think that that was part of the reason uh, for the neighborhood family health care centers. I think the, I mean, you have to go back. In the Lindsay years, the consumer movement in health care was not born yet. It just wasn't there. Uh, there was a lot of consumer desire for political control over the system, but there wasn't a great deal of, uh, of agitation, as I remember, for... Um, uh, uh, for in, in specific uh, health areas, and the, the the city did see the need for um, for primary care and did respond to that. But in terms of of what you're seeing now, in terms of prevention and uh, 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 consumers' uh, choice and, and and information that would allow consumers to make informed choices, that's all wonderful. But it wasn't. I, it just wasn't on the horizon in 19 in the mid 1960s. Well, and community action was there, but not uh, Medicare and Medicaid choice. were actually pr uh, the pump for acute care medicine. And doctors, you know, we we created this mess because we we decided to pay for procedures and pay well, that's for true. you know for Good treatment. Point diagnosis and treatment after people got sick and and so you're correct they're they're and it's still true so the transition you know insurance companies don't want to put money into prevention because patients don't stay with them longer than a year or two and then they go to another insurance company so the system is uh, at least a decade away from from doing this because of the way the economics work although people are getting smarter and smarter all the time. And the health commission, this is becoming recognized as a public health problem. So the commissioner, Commissioner Farley's going after salt, uh, sugar, uh, obesity, in, in, right. if we can figure out how to attack that. This is the conclusion of this segment of the Lindsay Year Symposium in which we've been looking at innovations that were introduced into the operation of New York City government from 1966 to 1973. This symposium is being held at Baruch College, and I look forward to seeing you when we return for the next installment of this symposium.